Hello, I'm Locke Meredith, and I'd like to invite you to join me on the next Legal Lines. I have on the show Sean Fagan. He's my partner in law practice, and we're going to talk about the effect of tort reform, medical malpractice specifically, tort reform, and also ERISA. And what effect does that have on your ability to sue your insurance company or to sue for medical malpractice? So join me with Sean Fagan on the next Legal Lines. Want to learn the secret to big savings on TV, internet, and phone? It's bundling your services with Cox. When you bundle with Cox, you get digital cable, high-speed internet with power boost, and telephone, all for one low monthly price. That's three fantastic services at one low price that will make you smile. The secret is out. The more you bundle, the more you save. So get a whole lot and save a whole lot when you bundle with Cox. Welcome to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith, and I'm very pleased to have on the show today Sean Fagan. He's my partner in the practice of law. And we're going to talk about some really very interesting issues. Uh, currently on the, the big picture is the health insurance plan being contemplated by Congress. Sean, thanks for being on the show. Right. Let's try and educate folks a little bit about, uh, I guess, the consequences of the various positions taken by both the Republicans and the Democrats of, of what they're proposing up up in D.C. right now? Well, right now the big, obviously, debate is you know, how, how are we going to handle health care? Because it is out of control. The it, expenses it, it, of health insurance and health care is out of control. There's no two ways about it. I don't think anybody could seriously say that some sort, some sort of reform doesn't need, need to occur. The question is, what form does it take? And right now the most radical approach that, 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 that's being um, at least put up by Congress is let's take over the whole health care industry and see if we can uh, essentially have health care that covers everybody in the country and whether or not that's a wise thing to be done by government versus business. At least the one positive thing uh, is that Congress now recognizes that this is an area of our economy and of our experience in America that has to be fixed because it is absolutely broken. Let's explain to the folks um, why. Okay, first of all, one of the, the elements that I'm hearing banted around right now uh, is this whole idea of tort reform being some great component to solving the problem of great health care expenses. So let's discuss it in the context of cases that you and I have actually handled here mm -hmm. in the state of Louisiana, which has one of the strongest tort reform programs in the nation. Tell the folks what, what we have in terms of Louisiana tort reform. We have uh, one of the most um, restrictive products liability statutes in the country. Uh, we have a medical malpractice act or statute that covers both public and private health care providers. That's one of the most restrictive in the country. And let's talk about that because that's really what this, the health care is focusing on. Mm -hmm. All right, in Louisiana, the maximum amount that you can recover from mental and physical pain and suffering, disfigurement, dysfunction, disability is what? $500,000. That's it. Since 1976. Since 1976, the most that you can collect for those damages is $500,000. That's right. And that Period. And, and of course the, the 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 genesis of that was the idea that the healthcare industry uh, in particular was under assault. There were not going to be any doctors that were going to be able to practice in Louisiana. Healthcare costs were going to be too high because insurance costs were going to be too high. So the solution was to come up with a comprehensive act that was going to limit liability and therefore reduce insurance rates, make health care affordable for all the, the, the citizens of the state, and provide good health care. And, and the bottom line is they're saying, look, the most you'll ever have to pay, no matter what the damages are to the victim, is $500,000. Therefore, your exposure, the amount the insurance company will have to pay, is limited. That's therefore, right. your premiums should be controlled. Docs, please stay here. That's right. Well, in fact, their premiums have continued to go up, haven't they? That's right. The premiums have gone up ever since 1976, even though the cap has not changed since 1976. And let's talk about the consequence. In 1976, this cap on damages was placed. Here we are, uh, what, almost 30 years later, 32 years later, it hasn't been changed. Mm -hmm. For a person, as I understand it, the real value, if you took $500,000 in 1976 mm -hmm. and converted it into today's dollars to account and adjust for inflation, it would only be worth around $170,000. Even less, $130,000. According to 2009, if you go into the, the governmental database, they have an inflation calculator. You put $500,000 in in 1976 dollars, what's it worth today 
in 2009 would be 1.8 million. To keep up with inflation, the cap would have to be 1.8 million just to give people in 1976 the same recovery, or sorry, people in 2009, the same recovery that people had in 2000. So bottom line is if you were injured in 1976, you'd have gotten 500,000 bucks. Mm -hmm. Today, in reality, that person's way better off than you were because yeah. they're only getting about 130,000. That's correct. In real value. That's correct. All and right. The other, the other component of it is, is, is that it limits the exposure, the personal liability of any medical doctor in this state for malpractice to $100,000. That's the most that individual can be sued for. Mm -hmm. And of course, they purchase insurance for that and they pay that. That should be the maximum premium that you think would be justified. But of course, their premiums have continued to go up year after year for the last 32 mm -hmm. years. Which doesn't make sense because you say to yourself, if the most you can be exposed to is a hundred thousand dollar loss why would the premium go up in your case i mean it's not like there's additional loss the insurance company has to worry about a hundred thousand dollars is it and it's been that way since 1976 but the premiums have not remained stagnant and so if the victim is not being uh, fully compensated not recovering any more money because that c damage has been capped and the doctor's exposure hasn't gone up but his premiums are who's making the money and that's, that's, that's the that, big issue, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind and of a big issue. And you would logically say it's the insurance companies. Mm -hmm. Let's also talk about the fact that um, uh, in Louisiana, you had the medical review panel. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this talk about the frivolous uh, lawsuits, medical malpractice lawsuits that are filed, and, and that that increases the cost of health care because you've got to deal with the premiums and all that. Well, we've set up in Louisiana the, the medical review panel. Explain that mm -hmm. to folks. The way that works is before you can step into a courtroom, you've got to go through a panel of three doctors that practice in the same field as the de doc doctor that's been accused of malpractice. And there's no conflict of interest. If they that's know right. them, they can still sit on the panel the whole bit. That's right. There's the, 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 the oaths they take, but it, uh, it, as in most states, it's a relatively small community, especially if you're dealing with a specialization, uh, like, you know, uh, you know, pick one that, that specializes in a very small group of patients, they're going to know each other well. So it's hard to find someone who doesn't know someone else in the field. But the bottom line is, is that uh, that process serves to get rid of really the frivolous uh, complaints. Why? Because you go through, the three doctors give an opinion at the end of the panel, and if they say that malpractice has not occurred, you then have an opportunity to review their rationale. If it's right, no attorney in their right mind is going to carry the case forward. They're because in essence, it. you're getting almost for free uh, purported expert opinions mm -hmm. of whether or not malpractice occurred. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, as, as is statistically proven, I think it's like 98% of medical review panels find that there was no medical malpractice. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's so a, it makes you question the process yeah. a little bit. It's an exceedingly high percentage, but it, again, it's a flawed system in the sense that it's tough to have the folks judging each other. It's a difficult position to be put in. But uh, when it comes to the lawsuits, generally what you find is, uh, as any attorney that's out there practicing, whether it be on the plaintiff or defense side, you're running a business. So you're not going to take a frivolous case forward just for the heck of it. So you look at the cases and the ones that generally go into the court system are ones that are, that are well founded and are by no means frivolous. Because let's point out, uh, the bottom line is to prosecute a medical malpractice claim, it is probably one of, if not the most expensive mm -hmm. type of case to litigate. Your client doesn't have the money. Typically, they're not mm -hmm. fronting the, the cost. You have to hire out-of-state experts who are 10 or 20 or 30 grand, if not more, to testify. Uh, you have multiple levels of experts. It's incredibly expensive. Mm -hmm. You're not going to move forward unless you think there's really something there. And put on top of that, the fact that you know there's a limited recovery for your client. That's right. Most so you're going to get five hundred thousand dollars. So if you spend a lot of money on the case, the the the, the client doesn't get as much for their for their injuries. So. And it's important to note also that you cannot file a lawsuit until you have gone through this medical review panel, assuming all the, all goes according to plan. That's correct. So you have to go through the medical review panel session first, then you can file a lawsuit. Let's talk about that, and then we're going to talk about ERISA in the next segment. This is Lock Mayor with Legal Lines, Sean Fagan. We'll be right back. Everybody loves On Demand from Cox. Well, did you know the love's about to grow? Soon, your On Demand menu will have a whole new look, making it easier than ever to find your favorite shows, access hundreds of movies, and thousands of free programming choices, even HD, just like that, so you can watch what you want to watch when you want to watch it. It just keeps growing better every day. See what's coming On Demand and get more out of what you're into with Cox Digital Cable. 
Welcome back to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith. Again, pleased to have on the show Sean Fagan. He's my partner in the practice of law. We're talking about uh, health insurance issues proposed by the federal government and how Louisiana deals with medical malpractice. Mm -hmm. Sean, we were talking about the process that one has to go through when they file a medical malpractice claim and basically a lot of hurdles you got to jump over. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about it in the case of, frankly, a very sad case that we've been involved in mm -hmm. uh, where a 14-year-old girl ultimately had her leg amputated because of mm -hmm. medical malpractice as determined by a jury. That's correct. It, was, it went through the medical review panel process. In that particular case, the, the medical review panel said there was no malpractice. And uh, it went to jury. The jury considered right. all the evidence. And hired an out-of-state That's right. expert That's right. and spent thousands of dollars. That's right. It, it was an expensive case to try because trying to find an expert here in the state was, was difficult given the specialties involved. And so uh, some out-of-state um, doctors came in. They were the top in their field in terms of writing and, and research and practice and they came in and said there's there's no question about the the malpractice the the, the young girl's arteries uh, artery in her popliteal leg and artery. Yeah, popliteal artery and vein were both severed during an operation and it resulted in her losing her lower leg and the doctors all agreed that that sh should never have occurred if it was done properly and let's talk about what she went through because mm -hmm. it was severed and then they tried to sew it back up and fix it on multiple occasions mm -hmm. never did get the the flow of of the blood back through the limb it basically died mm -hmm. over several weeks, and then a month or so later, they had to amputate the leg of the 14-year-old girl. That's right, and so it, a lot of suffering. A lot, a lot of facts that that just were were difficult, and and on the in the medical malpractice side, it wasn't the, the sympathetic facts, although they were sympathetic, that really drove the case. It was it was clear that when you really looked at the, at the procedure, that a mistake had occurred. Doesn't mean the doctors were bad doctors. No. Doesn't mean they're evil doctors. It just means that they made a mistake. Just like if you're driving down the road and you're adjusting your radio and you hit somebody, doesn't make you a bad driver or an evil person. And let's make it clear, mm -hmm. we so very much appreciate the sacrifice mm -hmm. doctors and their families make to our society. Mm -hmm. We're not in any way deriding doctors. They are such a great contribution mm -hmm. to our society. We're frustrated with a system right mm -hmm. now. And the system in that case, uh, is, it's a girl that, because of her age, will never be able to really work in, in, in the workforce the way, way she could have. Um, and uh, Tremendous economic loss. Just tremendous economic loss. But the bottom line is, try to a jury. They <clears throat> found that there was malpractice. There were several different physicians involved. They found that uh, two of them had committed uh, separate acts of malpractice. Mm -hmm. uh, but the most that can be collected because of the tort, quote, tort reform that we have here in Louisiana is? $500,000. So she, she, even though she has economic loss in terms of her inability to earn income for the, her entire life, her entire working life, um, she's limited to $500,000 both on her loss of income her ability to earn income, as well as her injury for the pain and pain suffering, suffering, whatever else. And scarring and disability right. and everything that goes with it. All that's limited to $500,000. And the irony of that is, when we put it in the context of tort reform and, and what, what the government's talking about now, is this girl is now likely to be on Medicaid and Medicare where she otherwise would not have been had there been a full recovery allowed to her through the insurance that's afforded to the doctors. And, and, with, and, and insurance, the concept of insurance is to shift the burden of risk amongst the entire population sure. instead of making the sole victim bear the brunt of that loss, particularly if it wasn't their fault. Mm -hmm. But that's the bottom line what's happening because this victim uh, is in such dire straits She's going to be forced on, as you indicated, the social mm -hmm. system or, or network that we have to hopefully provide care for, but who knows? That's right. Uh, let's talk about the effect that ERISA has had on uh, the whole health care industry. Because what we're talking about is, in this case, this was allegations of malpractice against doctors, but there are situations where there have been alle uh, allegations of malpractice against insurance companies for not authorizing timely care or appropriate care, um, but you can't go after them. The only party you can go after is the doctor, and the reason you can't go after them is ERISA. In fact, I'm thinking of that movie where the, I forgot the young actor's name, but he takes on this big evil health insurance company and he wins at the very end and everybody's high-fiving because he's taking care of his client. That's a fantasy. It can't happen in America. Explain why. All right. Most people don't realize it, but if you work 
at a job and through your job you get something other than wages, uh, a health care plan, a pension plan. Anything that comes from your employer other than wages is, cons is presumptively covered by ERISA, which is a federal statute that governs coast to coast. It preempts, meaning that it wipes out virtually all state law that would normally apply to that and only applies the federal law. And, and what happens in ERISA is that it's so comprehensive that most employers have no idea that what they offer their employees to try to, as an incentive to come to work, is governed by federal law. And they find out too late, as do the employees, especially when it comes to health care. So let's, uh, to, just to bring it down in a nutshell, because potentially one of the benefits you receive for working somewhere is health insurance, mm -hmm. and because that's considered an employee benefit, a RISA law, federal law, then applies to the management of that health insurance product mm -hmm. and the health care you get. And you cannot use any state law remedies at all to go after an insurance company that doesn't provide timely or appropriate care because federal law says we're the only law you can use. That's right. The, the, the state law remedies that are available are very narrow. And, and generally, it's going to be federal law that's going to, going to make or break the claim that you've made that you've made against your own um, health care insurance company for coverage. And so we have two situations where you would potentially go after the insurance company, the health insurance company, either because they didn't authorize appropriate or timely care. Like, let's say, doc says you need surgery, and they says, no, nah, we want you to go get some more second opinions, or we're just not agreeing to it, or whatever. Uh, or they don't, uh, or they deny coverage completely. Mm -hmm. So they don't, either don't do it timely, or they don't do it at all. And, but and you can't go after it. Th this is the thing. Uh, ERISA, when it was first enacted, was there for pensions. Was, it was the idea. And of course, it grew and grew to also cover health care plans. Everyone knew that pension plans needed to be protected when this law was first considered. Since it grew out into health care, no one really saw what was coming, how that law would really impact the industry. And, 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 and what happens now is as you go down that path and you try to get the coverage, you can't go after the insurance company because the insurance company both provides the plan and usually is the administrator. Under ERISA law, the administrator most of the time, according to the plan documents, has sole authority to not only interpret the plan, but then to, 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 to pay out, f figure out what's covered under the plan. And so when, 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 when the insurance company both makes up the plan itself and is the one interpreting its own coverage, the next thing you would say is, if you disagree, let's go to court. Let's make sure that they're interpreting it well, right. Let's point ERISA out the takes that away. And let's point out the conflict of being the administrator and the provider. I mean, who's the administrator being employed by? Who do you think he's going to protect? Mm -hmm. He's going to protect the insurance company, not the, the person seeking the, the coverage or the benefit. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, 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 there are specific examples that we've dealt with in, in our practice that highlight it. But the, the amazing thing is, and what most people don't recognize, is that now in 2009, over one-third, over one-third of all employee compensation, all employee compensation packages are covered by risk. All right, let's continue that on the next segment. This is Locke Merritt with Legal Lines and Sean Fagan. We'll be right back. Some people still don't have on-demand from Cox. Impersonators. Who oh, you calling an impersonator, pal? No, 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 you insulted him a little bit. A little bit? A little bit. Uh, is there a reason you all aren't using on-demand from Cox? Because I thought you guys would love access to thousands of movies and shows. The stars don't like to watch. No, they're all movies. It's tacky. Mm, did I mention a lot of it's free? Free is hot. <laughs> Boom. On-demand from Cox. Perfect for almost everyone. Welcome back to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith. I have on the show today Sean Fagan. He's my law partner. And we're talking about the effect of medical malpractice tort reform and the federal law ERISA. Sean, we talked about the inequity, and it, certainly in our opinion, of the Louisiana medical malpractice uh, tort reform in the context of a very sad case where the little girl had her, her leg amputated at age 14. Um, we didn't really note that the, the jury awarded $3.8 million for her losses, but all she can get is $500,000, even though the jury said her loss is 3.8. All she can get is $500,000, even though we had three doctors that, that the jury found committed malpractice. That's right. In fact, two separate acts of malpractice they found. And, and what's sad about it is the vast majority of her award was for economic loss, not pain and suffering with people, 
you know, would normally be subject to debate, but hard losses this girl was going to sustain over her life, and it's limited to $500,000. And what's so frustrating for me is, is I've read all kinds of articles about this, and I've seen the number range from a half a percent to up to 2% of the $1.5 trillion health care component of our economy is related to medical malpractice. That's right. That's it. It's like the tail wagging the dog. A half to 2% of that whole big pie is related to medical malpractice, but they want to enforce this really just system on, on victims. It's crazy. It is. It's, like I said, it's the tail wagging the dog. It's, Let's talk about ERISA because it, to me, is equally as frustrating. Okay. Uh, we talked about how basically federal law has said, we are not allowing you to sue your health insurance companies if, it, if you get that health insurance as a benefit of being an employee, you have to use federal law. You cannot use state law remedies. And of course, the federal law applicable, applicable is ERISA, and it doesn't let you go after them. That's right. Best illustration is a case we've had. A sophisticated insured. A lawyer. A lawyer. Uh, is looking at having uh, a surgery done that's, that, that's really cutting edge surgery. He does the research finds out that this surgery is mainly performed in Florida, outside of Louisiana. He goes to his health care plan, says, listen, uh, I, I want to have this surgery done. It's going to be done in Florida. Uh, will you guys cover it? They say, well, you know, and again, this is an ERISA-governed plan. So he takes the steps that a lot of people wouldn't know to take because he is, he, he's, in, he's sophisticated in this regard. So he goes in and asks, hey, look, you know, what, what will you guys pay for this? Well, you don't have to get pre-certification. Yeah. We'll um, send you any documents you need. What do you need? Right. We'll fill out any documents you need. We don't need anything. So nothing, you know, it, he goes down and has the surgery done. Uh, it's, it, it, it's, it's an expensive surgery. And when it's all said and done, he gets back and his health insurance company says, we're going to pay 20% of the entire cost. So the surgery, I think, was around $30,000. Mm -hmm. And they said they were going to pay, what, five? Yeah, it was, it was just it was a, a small percentage of what was there. Well, naturally, uh, the attorney says, well, you know, this is crazy. I, I, I've got to come out of pocket for this. It's already been done. Why didn't you tell me up front? And, and so an appeal starts because under arrest, you can't go into court first. You have to go through the health care plan's appeal process. And this is what we were talking about earlier. In this case, it's one of the largest insurance companies in Louisiana. Not only did it write the health care benefit plan for this attorney's uh, employer, but also is the administrator of that plan. So as administrator, Same it is person in, wearing two hats. That's right. And which, in, in theory, they you know they might be down the hall from each other, and they really don't communicate. But in reality, we know that that's not the case. They both work for the same company, and and so now the administrator interprets the plan and says, well, uh, we feel that there are other physicians here in Louisiana that did that same procedure, even though you couldn't find them. Now this lawyer and would do it for five thousand dollars. That's right. And, and this lawyer uh, is knows the, the, the neuromedical community here in Baton Rouge, knows the spine specialist here in Baton Rouge, had contacted all these different physicians to see if they knew someone who did this procedure and no one knew it. These are some of the top uh, spine surgeons in the state and they couldn't identify somebody who did this procedure. That's why he went out of state. When he comes back in, they say not only were we able to, did somebody do it in Louisiana, but they do it for a lot less, and that's why we're going to pay so much less. And that's for, all you get. Yeah, to the to the lawyer. So they they basically deny the appeal. Mm -hmm. So the lawyer uh, files suit, mm -hmm. and federal law applies via ERISA. You file it in federal court. Mm -hmm. Not going to use the state court remedies because you can't. That's right. And, uh, and the lawyer has no chance to depose. That is, to go to that administrator who said, oh, yeah, we got plenty of people do that in Louisiana, and they'll do it for five grand. Can't go to that person and say, I want to talk, talk to you on the record. I want to ask you some questions. I want to have you identify every single doctor that did this and that they would do it five. Can't ask the administrator can't, that, can you? Can't go in, and this is the irony. I, I spoke you know, uh, at length to, to the attorney uh, uh, for the insurance company in this case. Let me ask you something. If this lawyer had called up and said, identify for me, is there a service that this lawyer could call through the insurance company and say, identify for me physicians in Louisiana that do this practice, do this procedure, and then let me look at them and figure out which ones seem to be the most well-versed in it and decide, is there a service available through your company to do that? No. But after, you, after the attorney has already had the procedure done, all of a sudden, there is a database they can go to that says what doctors they do this say procedure. There's they a say, database, but you have to.